All right, on we go, on we go. Um, today is exercise 204, and we're taking a break from Rhino, and we're gonna go into V-Ray for a little bit. And I've found over time that by mixing, you know, we do some Rhino, then we come back to V-Ray. Then we do some Rhino, then we come back to V-Ray. It kind of builds up both skills at the same time. And so I try to devote, like, today we're gonna spend the whole day working on V-Ray. And there's always a little bit of Rhino, but I try to devote, hey, here's a day on V-Ray, and then we'll go back to Rhino for a few days. By the end of the semester, we kind of mix both. So you'll be doing Rhino and V-Ray kind of all at once, and there's, there'll be an expectation for that. But in the beginning, it's, it's, it's a daunting task to, to get used to uh, V-Ray and how it works and where the options are and that sort of thing. So a um, couple things. We're going to start in part one, uh, and the first thing that I want you to do is to create uh, a simple composition of five objects. And I don't really care what the objects are. Um, these are objects that we're going to apply some materials on, and you can kind of see how the various materials work. So I would pick from the standard primitive objects. So I'll start first with a box corner to corner, uh, which is this tool right here. I can work in the perspective view. Uh, sizes don't really matter, but somewhere in the neighborhood of about four feet by four feet uh, is a good place to start. Oops, forgot the comma and then we'll do it four feet tall. It gives us a general size parameter. Oh, there we go. I forgot to turn off that OpenGL, so I'll do that again. Uh, let me go to Tools and Options. All the way at the bottom under View, OpenGL, and I'll turn off that Tessellation option so that I can see everything. Perfect. Uh, if I want to see these in solid instead of in wireframe, I'll click the downward facing arrow here in my viewport name and change to uh, Shaded just so I can see the sides of the object. And then I'll create a few more objects. So there's a, there's a box. Underneath there, I have things like a cylinder. So we'll throw a cylinder in there. Um, maybe it's a little bit taller. Sure, we might as well throw a sphere in there. Put that right there. Uh, the sphere loves to be below the ground when you create it. So you generally need to move it up you could do that in two ways. Uh, the first way would be to use the move command. So if I went to transform and then move right here. Um, but if I look at the command line, there's an option to choose vertical or not. So if I don't choose vertical, I'm only going to move it in the X and Y plane. I'm not going to move it up. So when I choose move, I want to make sure that I am I'm clicking on this vertical option, in which case I can move it up. Alternatively, I could show all my views and then move it in this view. And I could simply drag it in that view to move it up. So it's just another option for how you move it. So there's a little sphere. Let's put a little space in between that and the other objects like that. Uh, let's see here. What else do we have? Sure, we could do a cone. Do a cone over here. Maybe like that. And uh, last one. Let's do a pyramid. And let me stick the pyramid right back over here. And so my goal is to kind of be able to create a little bit of a composition of my shapes. Uh, what it looks like doesn't really matter, but this is something that we're going to play around with with our various materials. So I created those five shapes. Those five shapes, shapes are currently on the default layer. They can stay on the default layer, or I could change each shape onto a different layer. Kind of doesn't really matter for what we're doing today. But in order to, to really work through um, the, the rendering process, there's some options that we're going to change in, in V-Ray. And so under step two, I'm going to introduce you to V-Ray, and I'm going to show you uh, a lot of the options that are built into V-Ray. Um, so first thing we need to kind of go through is V-Ray itself. And so there's actually two V-Ray toolbars that show up here. I don't know why there's two, um, but you can access V-Ray uh, using either one, and the first button is kind of like a sphere with a V on it. Um, that is the V-Ray Asset Editor, and that's where almost everything is now uh, contained when it comes to V-Ray. So I'm going to click on that button, and it's going to bring up this V-Ray Asset Editor. And you've seen this a little bit before, because in the first <laughs> exercise I had you apply some materials. Uh, today we're going to spend a little bit more time really digesting what's going on in this V-Ray Asset Editor. Uh, the big change between the old version of V-Ray and the new version of V-Ray uh, is how everything's organized. And so everything, it used to be separate. We had like a V-Ray settings box that would open. We had a V-Ray materials box that would open. So we had these different 
pieces of V-Ray. Now everything's in one box, so it gets a little confusing because there's a lot of stuff in here. So with V-Ray Asset Editor open, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to click on the gear icon for settings. That's going to jump me over into the settings section. And once I have that shown, I'm going to go through some of these options to kind of talk you through what's happening. Generally speaking, the default options, luckily, are reasonable. So we don't need to change too many options, but I'd rather kind of walk you through what's happening as we go forward. So under the basic settings here, under render, we have the ability to choose whether the rendering is happening using the, the CPU or the GPU. The GPUs on these computers aren't really that great, so I wouldn't recommend switching over. Uh, I don't think you get much benefit out of it. You're better off using the CPU. Um, the next toggle down here is something called interactive rendering. And this is something that V-Ray developed um, where what you see on the screen is an actual V-Ray render. And when you move or when you change an object, it re-renders that part of the scene. It's pretty uh, intensive for what it takes out of the computer. So I don't recommend leaving it on unless you really need it for some reason. And so maybe at the end of the semester, you might use it. But for the meantime, we'll just do a one-off rendering. Oh, let's render this scene and see what it looks like. Um, it'll end up saving a lot of uh, processing time as we go forward. Uh, progressive is important to be switched on. What that means is as V-Ray renders, you can save at any point while it's rendering. So you don't have to wait for it to finish. You can say, just keep rendering, uh, and I can save it. And then later on, when it finishes in a half hour, I can save the finished version. So I can work on it in the process. Um, so that's usually good to leave on. Uh, quality is what it says. How high is the quality of the rendering? Uh, it's a toggle button. We'll leave it on medium for right now. We don't need anything higher than that for our purposes uh, here. I should also point out that everything I'm doing here is written out in tutorial form, so I can talk about everything. So if you go to uh, V-Ray 8.1 on the course website, all this stuff is there. I also have, if you have the old version of V-Ray, I have the old options, and I talk through what all of those mean. So it has both. OK, so continuing on. Uh, down below that is something called the camera. Um, this is not something we're going to spend a lot of time with yet, but we will get into this. This affects how the renderings happen. We're going to use the default options here, and we're not going to mess around with that too much. But I'll come back to what the camera does. It has to do with how you're exposing the scene during the rendering. So we'll, we'll use that a lot in the semester, just not today. Uh, under render output, this is telling us what we're actually getting out of our rendering. Uh, this is where we can choose what the, the ratio of, of pixels would be, how big the rendering is going to be. Um, again, today, the default options are just fine. We don't need anything more than just what these default options are. Uh, there, I should point out here, there is a, an automatic toggle to save your image when it's done. Um, when you get further along in the semester, this is a good idea because you lose track of the fact that you were rendering something and it just, when it's done, it automatically saves to your flash drive. So you're not gonna, you're not gonna forget to save it down the road. So not something to worry about just yet because our renderings aren't gonna take that long, but I like to point out that it's there. The next tab here is a tab called environment. And so this environment controls what the environment of the scene looks like, what the background looks like, et cetera. And so right now, if we were to do a rendering, uh, and I could do a rendering right now and you could see it, I'm going to get kind of a blackish gray background and I'm going to get white objects on that. Um, for our purposes, ultimately, we're going to be rendering on kind of a clean white slate with our objects sitting there. So I'm going to change the background color here from black to white. And I'll do that by clicking uh, on this little color. So where it's black right there, I'll click on it. And I'm going to change the color from black up to this corner to be white. And that's going to change the background to white. If I perform the rendering now, you'll see that the background looks similar because we don't have an infinite plane just yet. We'll get to that in part three. So we've set, gone ahead and we've set that as uh, white. Let me double check here to make sure. Uh, yeah, it's got some. Um, Background blur. Let me see if I want to get rid of that. No, we we'll leave it in for right now. That's fine. OK, um, there are some environmental overrides. We will get into what these mean down the road. But I like to kind of walk you through what's going on. Um, and you can see already that there is a, a, a huge number of options that are built into V-Ray. And it can be very daunting. So the good news is most of them we don't have to touch yet. We'll get to those. OK, so that's environment. We've changed it to white. Uh, the next one is this material override. This would allow me to take all of the, uh, the materials that I've used in the scene and override them with one specific material. Uh, sometimes when you're rendering and you're having trouble and you can't understand what's wrong, 
this is a, a strategy for just take away all my materials temporarily and let me override them with a basic material and see what's going on and why it's not rendering out the way I want it to. Uh, and the last option down here is something called the V-Ray Swarm. Again, not something we need today, but this is where we use other computers in the lab to help our rendering. So if somebody's working on the computer, not doing a rendering, not using all the horsepower the computer has to offer, we can turn on the V-Ray Swarm and borrow computing power from other, other computers in the lab to help your rendering go faster, which is great, but again, not really necessary until the end of the semester. So we'll leave that one turned off. So the other thing about this is that there is always, so we have our basic options here, but you see this little arrow pointing out to the side. That arrow pointing out to the side gives us additional options hidden within. So this is one of those things about V-Ray. There's always these side drawers, and I mean, it's, it's a very convoluted program uh, in terms of how everything's set up. So these options out to the side are dealing with the settings but they're like additional options. So if we click that little triangle, we'll expand out to the side and I'll walk you through uh, some of these, most of which don't matter for right now, but it's nice to at least point out that they're here. Um, this ray tracing option uh, just has to do with how the rendering is being performed. The default options there are fine. Global illumination, we will leave that turned on. It also tells us uh, the two methods through which V-Ray is doing its render. Um, it's doing a light cache and then a brute force analysis of this. Again, those options don't matter, but it's important for you to be aware that they are there should you want to change how the rendering is being performed. Uh, caustics has to do with how light transfers through clear objects. So it's a very advanced setting or through water, through a liquid. Um, it really consumes CPU horsepower or computer horsepower to do it. So generally we leave it turned off unless you're doing a close-up rendering of liquid or light passing through a glass, passing through liquid or something like that. So we leave it off unless it's really necessary. Um, we're gonna not worry about volumetric environments here. Um, render elements, this is something we will use extensively later in the semester. Uh, they used to be called channels. They're great additional things that can come out of renderings that help you with Photoshop collage and whatever. But again, by default, we're not gonna worry about that. And the last one here is under switches. And these, we do wanna confirm a few things. So um, under geometry, we'll leave the displacement turned on. Under lights here, we would like lights to be turned on. Hidden lights, this is where if you have a light and you put it on a layer and you turn the layer off, do you want the light to go off when you turn the layer off or do you want the light to stay on even if you turn the layer off? Uh, I recommend leaving that unchecked because it's a great way of being able to turn the light on and turn it off. You just turn off the layer that the light is on. Uh, and we do want to be rendering shadows, so that is checked as well. So as you can tell, I didn't change too many things. I just wanted to walk you through what's going on in the world of V-Ray. So we'll come back to this V-Ray asset editor uh, in a little bit and I'll, I'll work through some more with it. But for right now, we'll go ahead and close it and we'll move on to part three or step three of part one. And that's where we're going to add some ground. So if I were to render this right now and look at what comes out, there's no ground. These objects are just kind of floating there. And so the first thing that we need to do is we need to put some kind of a piece of ground in. And V-Ray has a tool for this. It's called a V-Ray infinite plane. Essentially, it's ground that goes off into infinity in all directions. And so I'm going to add that, but I'm going to add that on its own layer. So here under layer one, I'm going to double click and change layer one to be called infinite plane. It would help if I could spell here. Uh, I'll change that to be called infinite plane. I'll make that the current layer. So I've moved the check mark down to infinite plane. And then I'll come up to the V-Ray toolbar right up here at the top. Actually, either one of them has it in it. And you'll see kind of a rectangle with an infinity symbol inside of it. That's what we want. I'll go ahead and click on that rectangle symbol with the infinity. It shows up now on my scene here. If I were to zoom out, you'd see it's a really large rectangle essentially. Once I have that infinite plane on the scene, and I might change the color here uh, so that we're not staring at that red ground so that it's gray there. And so I have that infinite plane on. I would recommend once it's installed to go ahead and click on the lock icon next to the infinite plane. So let me switch back to the default layer and then I'll click this lock icon. And that allows you to select your objects without selecting the infinite plane behind them. It also means that we're leaving a default white material on those particular objects. If I went and did my rendering now, 
it's much harder to see my objects because they're sitting on an, uh, a, basically a white plane. Now, they're sitting on some ground instead of floating in space. We can see just a little bit of the shadowing of the sphere here in white. But again, all of my objects are in white. So that's a good, that's good. We've got the infinite plane. The next one under part four is to install a basic directional light for our scene. So we have some light that is lighting our scene. So again, I would work on another layer. And so this time it's layer two, but I'm going to call this uh, light. I could call it directional light if I wanted uh, or whatever. We're keeping with the basics. I'm going to make that layer the current active layer. So I change the check mark to be on the light layer. And then I need to create the directional light. Now when I create the directional light, it's a little bit tricky to set it up if you don't have some guide objects to help you out. So let me show you this. So the, the, the button for it is right here. It's the, the parallel little arrows. And when I click on that directional light tool, it asks first for the end of the directional light vector. So let's say I picked it here. Then it asks for the start of the directional light vector. Well, the problem is when I'm placing this, it's just staying in the x, y plane. It's not going up in, so that's not pointing down at my objects in any way. It's just moving around in a circle. So it's, it's a little tricky to get it up into space at the angle you want. So what I recommend before you create that directional light vector is to give yourself a little box to use as a guide. I could use the box that I already created, or I could create another one. And for our purposes, I'll create another one. Something like this. I can then use the, the corners of this to snap to help me get the angle of my light. So let me show you now that I have this box. I'll click on this directional light tool. End of light direction vector. Oh wait, let me turn on end snap. There we go. Is right here. Start of light direction vector is right here. And so essentially what that did is it put my light up in space so that it's coming down on an angle toward my um, toward my objects. I can go ahead at this point and delete the, the box. I don't need the box. I just need the light pointing down like that. So this light that's pointing down at my objects is as if there's an infinite number of rays coming perfectly parallel. So it's not a spotlight. It's not going to cast a weird shadow. It's just kind of a general light from one direction. So it doesn't matter where this light is placed in the scene, just the angle at which it is placed. So I now have that set up. And so I'm going to zoom in here and get my scene set up the way I want it. I can choose how much of a perspective I want to be looking at it in. We'll say something about like that. The next part is because I'm doing renderings, and this is something I'm going to emphasize over and over in the course, is that before you perform a rendering, I want you to save the view so that you can go back and re-render in the same view. And what this does is it allows you to make changes to the rendering, change your materials, change you know, how the materials looks, uh, what the texture mapping looks like, or, or whatever. And you can always come back to the same rendering and re-render that render over and over. Uh, especially when you get to the end of the semester, you set up your view, and then you tweak, and you add, and you, you add more to your building, or you change the lighting in your building, or whatever, and you can always re-render from that same view. So we're going to save that view. It's right here under part five. And I'm going to do that by clicking on this little downward facing triangle. And I'll go down to the set view option. And the very last option there is named views. So one more time, it's the downward facing triangle, set view, named views. And that brings up this named views dialog box right here. There's a little disk icon that I can choose to save my view. And I can give it a name. So in this case, I'll just call it perspective one. And go ahead and say, OK. Please don't put any spaces in this. It's tempting to put the spaces in. There's a reason uh, long about lecture 25 of why I don't put spaces in. <laughs> so just trust me right now. Don't put the spaces in. I'll go ahead and say OK. And it then saves this perspective one. So the advantage here, I can close this, is that I can move around and I can work on my objects and, and do things. And then I can come back to this little downward facing triangle. I can go to set view and notice that perspective one is now listed. So that view is saved, and I can jump right back to that first perspective. If you've worked in SketchUp, it's like saving a scene in SketchUp. Same concept. So I have my view saved. I can jump right back into that particular view. So now that I have that view saved, I can perform a primary rendering here and just take a look at what it looks like. Again, I have no materials applied just yet. I can see a little bit of the shadowing showing up. 
Uh, and so as this started to progress, I'd see white objects with a tiny bit of shadow. It's not going to give me a whole lot until we apply some materials. So, so that's the next big part. So we've moved on. We've got through part one. We're going to move on into part two. And so here in part two, first thing we need to do is to assign some materials. And we're going to create some basic materials uh, to assign them. So first off, I'm going to open that V-Ray Asset Editor again that I talked about uh, at the beginning of class. And so here's my V-Ray Asset Editor. When I open that up, we worked with the settings before. I'm going to instead click this first button, which is Materials. And so right here under the Materials tab, uh, I see a Material Preview. And then down here at the bottom, I see materials that I'm using in my scene. Well, I currently don't have any materials in my scene, so I'm going to create some basic materials. Um, I did mention before that you could click this drawer out to the left side and pick some of the default materials. We will get to that later today, but for right now, we're creating brand new materials from scratch so you can see what the options are and how you can kind of work with the materials themselves. So to create a new material, I'm going to come down here to the new material um, button, which is the I guess it's this one, Add Material. It's not New Material, it's Add Material. There we go. And there are several different types of material that I can create. The one that we're concerned with right now is just a generic material, so nothing fancy. So I'll click on that, Add Material, and it's going to be generic. As soon as I do that, we see a live preview of what that material looks like. It's not the sphere inside that says V-Ray, it's the, the gray on the outside. That's what, that's what the material is itself. So now that I have this generic material, I'm going to click on the drawer to the right. So once again, I open up that drawer to the right, and it gives me material options. So it's because this material is selected that I now have material options. In the drawer to the right, the first option that I'm going to explore is this diffuse option right here. And so what, what uh, the fundamental makeup of this material is essentially the color. It's just a gray material. And I can change the color, the diffuse color of the material, by changing this value right here. So if I click on that gray box, my color picker will come up, and I can pick another color. I can pick red, for example. Notice that I have uh, RGB sliders. I have... Um, the hue, saturation, and vibrance adjustment sliders. Um, so I can pick a lot of different um, colors. I'm going to pick something like red here. And I'll go ahead and close that. And as soon as I've done that, notice that my gray, that what was gray, is now turned to red. I can also rename this material by double clicking on it and saying this is now red instead of generic. So I have that red material created. I've changed the basic color of that material. I can now apply it to an object. So I could click on this cone, for example. I could come over to red. I could right click on red and say apply uh, to selection. And it's going to apply that red material to this object. It sometimes um, is nice to see it in your scene. The preview is always a little iffy. But I can switch over here uh, by my viewport name into rendered mode. And I may or may not be able to see a live preview of it. In this case, because of the directional light, I'm able to see the live preview. So for our purposes today, I'm going to leave that on, and that way you can see the live preview as I start to create these. So the first material I created was red. The next material I'll create is going to be a different color. So I'll come down here and do the same thing. I'm going to do this five times, which is good for repetition, but I'm going to create five different colors. So I'll come up here to Add Material, Generic. There's the generic again. Under Diffuse Color here, I'm going to pick a different color. So let me come down here into the blues, and maybe I'll pick that blue. There it is. I'll rename that material to be blue. And then I'll apply it to the next object. So there's my uh, cube here. I'll right click and say Apply Material to Selection. Alternatively, I could, of course, apply the um, the material by layer, but again, that would apply to all of the objects, not just the individual object. So let me do that again. I'll click on the plus sign here. We'll create a new generic material. We'll change the color. And uh, let's do a, a pink. Sure, why not? Uh, this is more magenta. And we'll apply it to this object. So 
I'll right click and say apply uh, to selection. And there it is there. I'm just going to move over so I can see all my objects. And again, I'll continue on new generic. Probably should make a green material. Apply material to selection. There it is in green. Uh, and I should rename this to be green. And then we'll do it one last time for a generic material. And maybe this time I'll pick an orange. And we'll put it on this material here. So essentially I've created five generic materials, all of which are different colors. I've applied them to those objects and I can now go into my set view. I'm going to go back to that perspective one view and then I'll go ahead and perform a rendering. I can perform the rendering right from within the V-Ray asset editor. It's the teapot icon. Alternatively, I can press the teapot icon and the V-Ray toolbars or there's a blue sphere in the Rhino tools that will initiate the render as well. So there's lots of ways of starting it. I'm going to go ahead and click on the uh, teapot here and it will perform its first render. So it goes through and it performs its first light cache and then it goes through and brute forces the rest. As this starts to develop, you'll see more and more resolution appear as you, do, as you go through the rendering. Uh, and so as I'm looking at this and as it's starting to run through, it's on past 12 right now, we can see there's a little bit of a shadow being cast here. There's a shadow of this block being cast on this cylinder. There's a little bit of a shadow being cast by the sphere. The sphere is casting a shadow onto that pyramid. So all the shadows are being cast, which is good. And I'm getting my basic generic results. So at this point, it's finished. So I can go ahead and I can save this first view. So I'm going to click on the disk icon up here at the very top. And I'll save this onto my flash drive. So let me go in here into today's folder. And this is the spring of 2020. I'll just call it render one and then click save. Yeah. Um, it's possible that you have in your in the V-Ray frame buffer this window. It's possible that you have monochrome turned on. If if you do, then you can uncheck that and it should come back as color. It might be something that I have to sit and kind of sort through what's going on. Uh, not sure. Try clicking on this icon here as well. Switch to RB, RGB channel. That might help. No. Not sure. So we'll sit and we'll we'll sort it out. So what I did first was I, I did those generic materials. The next thing that I'm going to explore is what about if I wanted to make one of these materials start to become transparent. And so I'm going to pick on the blue material here because it's in front of the red and the magenta. So I'll be able to see this transparency start to happen. So over here in my uh, asset editor, I've selected blue as the material and I'm looking again at my material and I'm coming down here and looking for something called opacity. That's the next one. Um, so instead of transparency, it's opacity. And then here under opacity, I can control how opaque it is. It's currently on a scale from 0 to 1. So if I wanted it 50% transparent, I could change this value to be 0.5. And when I do that, I'll get a preview of what it looks like here in V-Ray. And I'll also get a preview of what it looks like in the scene itself. So I've just made that object somewhat transparent. So I've picked blue. I'm also going to pick the green because it's also in front. And this time, uh, under that opacity setting, instead of being 50%, I'm going to go like almost fully transparent. So I'll go maybe 0.25. So again, that's a value between um, 0 and 1, or you can pick this slider here. The little checkerboard pattern next to it is, is essentially more advanced options for the transparency. Uh, you can choose how it's applied. I'm not going to worry about that just yet. We'll, we'll revisit that in a couple more lectures, but I like to at least point out what that box is. Okay, so I have my transparency set there. I have my transparency set for blue. I'm going to go ahead and perform another render and take a look at what the full rendered version looks like.
so we'll let it keep running. You'll notice that as you add more complexity to the materials, the render takes longer. No surprise. And so as this is starting to go through, it's running through its pass one, we can already see that, yes, it's definitely showing up as transparent. The other thing that has a tendency to happen uh, with objects that are transparent, especially this blue one here, is when the transparent object is coplanar with the ground, when two, when two surfaces are right on top of each other, we get weird interactions between the two surfaces. So what I would recommend doing, I'm actually going to stop this render for right now, and we'll come back and re-render it, is I'm going to unlock the infinite plane, look at this in one of the front or side views, and I'll select the infinite plane, there it is. Let me close the V-Ray Asset Editor for right now. And I'm going to move it ever so slightly down. So I'll type move. Oops. There we go. And I'll move it just a little bit. You could move it, you know, an eighth of an inch. It's just a whisker below these surfaces. And it'll avoid that collision and give us better rendered results. So I've done that. I'll come back. I'll lock that infinite plane. I'll double click. I'll go back to my perspective one view, and then I'll come back and re-render. So I'll open the V-Ray Asset Editor, I'll click on the render frame, and we'll re-render it. And you'll see immediately that those, those artifacts that happen at the very bottom aren't going to happen anymore. So we'll give this a little bit more time to run. I'll save it in just a second, but I might as well, while it's rendering, come back and start exploring the next option. So we've gone through and we've done the diffuse color. We've done, next done the transparency on two of the objects. The next part that we're going to explore is what uh, w if we wanted to add some reflection to these objects. So I'm going to come over to the materials again. I'm going to work first with the blue material, and then I'll work with the solid material as well. So on the blue material here, I'm going to look first at the reflection tab. So right here under reflection. And so in reflection here, uh, the type of reflection is going to be a Fresnel reflection. So that's already selected. And I have a reflection IOR value right here listed. This value is really important. So I'm going to turn it on as an IOR. And we immediately see that it starts to reflect a little bit. The default, it's set at 1.6. Now this reflection IOR value is a known value for given materials. So for our purposes, we're just changing it. If I increase this value, it's going to become shinier. So if I said, oh, you know what, I want this to be 8, for example. This is going to become very, very shiny. If I wanted it to be, uh, let's see if the preview is showing us. It's taken a little bit of time to, to create the, the preview of it. If I wanted it to be not so shiny, I could go back down to maybe two. And it's going to be not quite so shiny. So part of this is exploring what these options are. If you're trying to recreate a specific material, you can actually do a Google search. And I might have, let me look, I might have a link to this already. Um, Let me see. Here we go. Sorry, I thought I had this list uh, posted here. Uh, this, is, this is available underneath the 8.4 material reflection layers. Right here, this is a link to the list of known IOR values. So here we are for 3D modeling, and you can pick any, uh, any type of material. Like, for example, I want to be able to render a diamond. The uh, IOR value for a diamond is 2.418. So you can actually look this stuff up depending on what it is you're trying to, to render or what material you're trying to render. Um, so I would encourage you to be able to look on something like that and then, and then pick it. So here's mercury. Liquid mercury is 1.620. So these are known values, and you can go in and pick that. For our purposes today, it doesn't really matter uh, what we're picking because uh, we're creating fake materials anyway. How about that? You can even pick white rum, what, what the reflectivity of white rum would be. So I guess given that we're doing that, I might as well pick that. So uh, 1.361 is that value. So I'm going to come over here, and I'm not going to do it on the blue. I'm going to do it on the, the magenta this time. And so right here under Reflection, I'm going to change this IOR 
to be 1.321. And so that adds a little bit of reflection, not too much. I'm also going to take one of these other objects, let's see, let's do the pyramid in the back. So let's do orange here, and I'm going to change that reflection to be very high. So in this case, my reflection IOR right there is going to be, I don't know, let's try 5.0. So it's real shiny. And so now that I have that, I'll go ahead and close my V-Ray Asset Editor, and I'm going to re-render the file. I already have a, a current rendering, so let me open up that frame buffer, which I think is hidden underneath something here. There it is. This was the, the finish of the last with just the transparency, no reflection. I'll go ahead and save that. So I'll click on the save icon here. It'll ask me where I want to save it. This is render one and we'll say dash two. I'll save. Then I'll go back and I will re-render. So let me open up V-Ray again. I'll open the V-Ray asset editor. I'll come back to the render button and I'll re-render. Now this time it has reflections added. So we have transparency and we have reflections. So it's going to take even longer to do the render. So you have to get used to the fact that these things uh, take more time. So we'll spend a little bit of time and let that one run. Okay. So, oh, it looks like I added, I'm looking down at my sheet here, I added reflection to four or five, four of the five materials. So you can add some more reflections uh, as you go. Okay, so, and we have the, uh, I already talked about IOR, that's good. Okay, a few other options in here. So we also have a highlight glossiness and a reflection glossiness. We can change uh, these values to be down if we don't want it. You know, like every object has some reflectivity to it. So if I'm looking at objects around me, right, I could see like this, this white here is more reflective than, say, the, the black of the monitor. But they both have some to it. Some are really shiny, some are not. You can adjust this glossiness to make the object appear more glossy or more matte within the amount of reflection that it's having. So we can turn on the reflection, but then we can choose how shiny it is, essentially, versus how not shiny it is. So I could edit any one of these to have less uh, glossiness there as well. Okay, so again, all of that is available underneath the reflection. I'm going to minimize that for a second. Below that, we have something else called refraction. So there's a difference between refraction and reflection. Refraction doesn't matter on a solid object. So I have, say, the, the red object here, right there. I can turn on reflection. And maybe we'll say that the IOR on this one is a diamond, so it's 2.41 or something like that. Not that you'd have a bright red diamond, but you get the idea. The refraction, however, doesn't really matter for this particular object. It's set, but it's a solid object, so we're not refracting any light through it. When we get to a transparent object, like this blue object in the front here, that one the refraction, refraction does matter because as light passes through an object that's transparent, it bends. And you've seen this happen. Like, you know, the, the prisms where the sunlight hits the prism and then it breaks the light waves apart and you see all the different colors of the rainbow? That, that's what's happening inside. It's refraction inside. So we have reflection coming off the object and then refraction changing how the light passes through the object. So if we have an object that's transparent, like this blue one, we're going to want to make sure that refraction is also turned on and that the refraction IOR matches. So in this place, I had the reflection IOR at 2. We'll come down here to the refraction IOR and we'll make sure that one matches as well. There are other options like fog color, for example. That's the, if you had glass that had a particular color to it, you could, uh, you could tint the glass using that fog color. Um, but it doesn't, it's beyond what we really need right now. There we go. So I've now made that adjustment for how the light is passing through this transparent object. And so you can see little subtle changes uh, over that. You do want it to affect uh, shadows. So that's turned on there as well. So realistically, I should do it for the sphere in front too. So let me come down to the green uh, and we'll go ahead and turn on the reflection and the refraction. And I've left them to, to match, so both are on. And now that one's going to have a little bit better 
uh, as well. So this one's finished. So I'll save this one. This was my uh, render version 3. I'll click Save. And then we'll go ahead and render again. Let me close that, let me open up my asset editor, and we'll start the render again. Again, we're adding complexity. We're adding reflections, etc. So we'll let this one run out. So I've now made it through. Um, last one here is step 11. We already talked about the glossiness, so I can change the reflection gl glossiness, right? Uh, where is it? There's the reflection glossiness. We could drop that one down on a particular object. Okay, so that gets us through part two. And again, this is all about exploring the materials. And I want you to go through and I want you to save these versions because I want you to have the experience of editing the materials. So follow along and do that or go back and watch the, uh, the tutorials to make sure that you're comfortable changing these basic material parameters. Okay, so once all of that's done, and again, I'm letting this one finish out its rendering, I'm going to come back and explore the materials that are already defined within, um, within uh, Rhino or excuse me, within V-Ray. So this is under part three. So instead of using the drawer to the right, I'm going to close that and open up the drawer to the left. So within the drawer to the left, this is where a bunch of pre-made V-Ray materials exist. So you can see, for example, that there are materials that are car paints. So I can look through those materials, and I could apply any one of these materials into the scene. So I'll take this turquoise, I'll drop it in. There's that kind of metallic turquoise, and you can kind of see. Now, this particular material, right, has settings associated with it. They've already set them up for us, but based on what we just learned, we could go in and we could see what's happening on these various settings. So we could go in here and we could say, oh, okay, so the opacity is at 100%, there's a reflection here. Um, you know, there's the glossiness value. So everything that I was just talking through exists within these, these options themselves. This might not be the best example because it's, it's a specialty material because it has little flecks in it. But you guys get the idea. I could come over into one of these others. So here's uh, fabric, for example. There's a bunch of different fabric materials. There's ground. This is like dirt and rocks. There's a leather. So I could pick leather. So, like I said, there's a lot of different materials. With, if you want to use any one of these materials, all you have to do is take the material and drag it over into your material list. There are a bunch of materials that you, students have created in the past or that I have used, some of which are updated for the new version of V-Ray, some of which are not. Uh, but on the course website, if you go to Resources, you come down here, there's a V-Ray materials library, and there's a bunch of materials that have been used in the past. So concrete, for example, has a bunch of materials. Anything with the digital tools logo on it is something that I've worked on and, and created for you to be able to use. So this whitewash concrete, for example, is a material. We could download that particular material. There's the zip package. I could save this on my flash drive, so let me extract it and I could drop it over on my flash drive. Now, I already have it, so I'm not actually going to do it, but uh, I can then load that particular material. So you can find these online. You can find them on the Digital Tools site if they're not materials that are already in the V-Ray library, and I can load those. So let me go back into um, Rhino and V-Ray, and to do that, I'm going to come down here to the Import button, which is the folder icon, and I could actually import a material. Maybe, if it likes me or not. Oh, this one finished, so I can go ahead and save that one. And, okay, so it's, it just asked me to open. Let me go onto my flash drive here. And so on my flash drive, I actually have a folder called resources. And inside of that, I have a folder called V-Ray. And inside of that, I have V-Ray materials. And this is a bunch of materials that I've worked on in the past. So these are different than uh, the materials. So I could come in and I could pick any one of uh, these pre-existing materials. Uh, and I could then, uh, let's pick this one. 
and I could load that particular material in. So in this case, it's like a little metal mesh, and I could apply that. Now, for, any, for the application of any of these materials, essentially all you're doing is selecting the object again, and then right-clicking and say Apply uh, to Selection, and it's then going to apply that material to the selection. When you then go and render it, it's going to change the material to whatever that new material would be. Now, sometimes when you load these materials, they don't look right on the object. That has to do with how the material is applied to the object, and that's a whole separate topic. So I'm not worried if it doesn't look. Like in this case, I put the mesh on this object and it gets all funky at the top. Yeah, it's not the end of the world. We'll fix that down the road. Uh, I'm going to stop this for a second. If, however, I applied it to this object, there we go, and I went and did the render. It would look a little bit more reasonable. It just depends on how the object is made. So I'm going to encourage you to assign five different materials to your objects. So figure out how to load them in or pick from one of the presets that's already in there and then save your result there as well. So I'd click on the save icon and save that one. Okay. After that, I'm going to ask you to open up the building that you were working on last class. So that floor plan, remember that we extruded and put all of that in and assign materials to that object as well. So it'll, it'll give you practice in a, in a brand new file. When you're all done, you're going to post all of these images to the course website. There's instructions on the back. It's a gallery. Um, those of you that were in 135, remember the galleries can be a little annoying to get them to set up correctly. Um, but if you need help posting, I'll help you, help you go through posting. I think enough of you know what to do that I'm not going to uh, go through it live uh, for you here as well. Okay, so I'm going let to you, let you work your way through this. If you have any questions, let me know. But this is kind of your first intro to, to how V-Ray works and how the rendering process works. I will let you guys get to work.